Hey guys, it's Tiny Tom Logan back with another video for you and today we're going to be taking a look at the Asus Z9 PE D8 WS. And the WS stands for Workstation. You may wonder why I'm looking at a workstation board because obviously generally we normally stick with the kind of the gaming boards and the overclocking boards and stuff like that. But the Asus is uh, one of the first boards to be released that supports the uh, or supports dual Xeons with the new 2011 socket. So I wanted to take uh, a good look at this. Um, uh, I'm going to be uh, in the main review that you can click to underneath. I've actually tested this with the E5 2660, which is a 2.2 gigahertz Xeon. That turbo's up to around 2.4, 2.6 gigahertz. It does go a little bit higher, but only on a single core. All of the cores normally stick around the 2.6 mark. Um, and I've also tested it with the top of the range, I'll say top of the range, but I'll kind of explain, the E5 2687. Now the 2687, there is a 290, 2690 above it, but the 2687 has got a higher non-turbo clock. The 2690 is 2.9 gigahertz, the 2687 is 3.1 gigahertz. So that's why I went for that one. Uh, and that will turbo up around the 3.4 gigahertz mark. Now, strangely, with the Xeon this time round, there isn't any overclocking at all. There's nothing you can do with them in terms of um, changing the multiplier. The base clock is there with an ability to be able to be um, tweaked, but the, the, the difference is that you really can't really do much with it. It's almost like the original Sandy. What a lot of people don't realise with the 2011 Xeons is that, uh, as I said, they're eight cores with hyper-threading, so that's 16 threads. So on the boards, we're gonna be having 16 um, actual cores with 32 threads, which is absolutely nuts. But the, like the 3960X, the way that Intel kind of keeps the prices down and keeps everything kind of at a level when you consider the amount of money that they put into research and development, is the speed bin. All of the 2011 processors have eight cores. They're just disabled, whether they don't work well enough or anything like that. Generally, the, the Xeons are like the, the cream of the crop, the really low power ones, the ones that work really, really well. All of the eight cores work. Um, and then as you get into the, the, say, the 3960X, they are the chips that overclock more, like more um, multipliers, all that kind of thing. So basically what they do is they, they speed bin them and they work out which chip's best of which and then they get put in the right places. The uh, lowest down the line will be the, uh, the 3820, which is obviously the quad core, so they must have some core problems, uh, multiplier problems with the other ones. But I don't want to get too much into that because it's very, very complicated. So we're going to be taking a look at this today. No overclocking, which is why uh, in the main review I've run two, seats, two sets of CPUs. In the video review, we're just going to concentrate on the uh, 2687, so go for the absolute cream. Although I may show you in the screenshots the, uh, the two side by side. Um, we're going to be running it with a 64 gigabyte of Corsair Vengeance RAM. Uh, the reason why I've done that is because uh, there's eight slots available on this. Two either side of each CPU and I've got two 32 gigabyte Corsair kits. So I've run 32 gigabytes for each CPU. We've also got an Asus 7970 on the bench table as a single card because then that will kind of tie in with the results that we've done previously on the RAM page. Um, and uh, as I'll show you in a minute, just uh, for a kind of, I won't say shock tactics, but uh, just for a little bit of awe, just to be a little bit different, what I've also done is I've run uh, a H100 for each CPU. So we've got two H100s running on the same rig. Um, and uh, just in case any of you are wondering, I'm going to put the link for the Tiny Tom Logan page on Facebook underneath because I have been leaking photos for this on Facebook over the last kind of five days. Uh, and that's what I like to do with all the peeps on Facebook. That is a place to follow me and what I'm doing and kind of, so you can kind of get an early look at stuff. It's a pretty good community on there as well, so it's worth going to take a look. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bring you all in for a closer look at the board, the new test bench that we're using on this today. Uh, and then, yeah, basically we'll have a good look around it, have a bit of a discussion and then we'll move on and I'll show you uh, the benchmarks. Um, and then we'll wrap up all at the end with a uh, conclusion on what we think. So, yes, uh, it's time for us 
to move on. Grab the trusty remote. So yeah, let's get going. Right then, peeps, first look at the crazy system. As you can see at the top, we've got the two H100s, which I've got running with Noctua and FF12s. Everything is obviously on the uh, Z9 PED8 workstation board. So we've got the two H100s. We've also got the uh, two DIM slots either side of each RAM kit. Now, each RAM kit, two DIM slots either side of each CPU. That may not seem a lot, but we've got 64 gigabyte of RAM on this board, so you can have up to a total of 32 gigabyte per CPU, even if you just chucked um, a couple of 16 gigabyte kits, 16 gig for each CPU. Still, that's 32 gig in total. So that's absolutely, it's, isn't, it's enough. If you'd had eight DIMM slots there, then you would have ended up with a HTPX board, which would have been a fair amount bigger. I think this is a nice balance. Now, one thing to realise here is you've got the 24 pin power right up at the top. So they've moved that up to the top to save room down the side. Uh, we've also got two 8 pin power for the uh, CPUs at the top. There is, however, a second Mo uh, uh, Molex rather up here should your PSU not have uh, two 8 pins. I'd be a little bit concerned about that, though. I'd pro I personally prefer to keep it you know, powered properly. Most decent power supplies nowadays have got two eight pins so I'd be a little bit concerned if if you didn't have it. Um, down on this side uh, don't really want to just show you the back panel but there's uh, two four USB twos sorry six USB twos two USB threes there's an audio out on the back and two um, Ethernet ports which are both Intel Ethernet there is also a PS2 on the back that's for keyboard and mouse. Now I'm just kind of having a skirt around to try and see where the fan um, headers are. Now there's there's one up here, just hiding away. Then we've got two fan headers. Crikey, I need to move those lights. Two fan headers here. Um, I'm just going to remove these. There we go. Remove those now. Basically, these two blues are SATA 6. The four blacks and the four blacks here are SATA 2. And then we've also got four SATA 6 here. Um, sorry, SATA 3, SATA 3, SATA 2, SATA 2, SATA 3, SATA 3. I'm forgetting, getting mixed up between SATA 3 uh, and SATA 6 gigabits a second. But these are also to do with... Um, uh, SSD caching. So, SATA 6, those four, SATA 6, those two, SATA 6 gigabits a second, and then the black ones are the slower SATA 2. And you may find it a bit strange that there's two um, USBs, like external USBs, actually on the board. But the idea with this is if you've got it in a server rack or um, under your desk or something like that, you can actually use these so that when you moving the system in and out or moving the rig in and out on the rack you don't need to pull it right the way out to stick a USB in and then you also with these internally you also don't have the risk of snapping a USB stick off if it is in the back uh, so that's pretty good now down the bottom we've got uh, Firewire is the red Inter sorry, external USB 2 is the blue we do have a USB 3 onboard header which is a nice touch um, this is the uh, BIOS chip and then the CMOS clear. Uh, we've got a fault finder or a PCI poster, whatever you want to call it. These are great to, when they freeze so you can work out the error codes. We've also got a, a power and reset button on board. Not necessarily something that you may need so much for a, um, uh, a workstation rig. But then again, again, if you were to be using it in a rack, you could still turn it on without having to find all the power cables and the stuff like that. We do have um, four PCI Express 16 lanes. Now, basically, you can run two. They're, they're all wired up electrically as um, 16, but you can run two c cards at 16 if you start going to triple and quad then they drop down to eight times there is an eight 
another black one of these just hidden just underneath those but those are all wired up as eight times electrically so that means that the pins stop where my finger is whereas all the blue ones they go right the way to the end so it doesn't matter where you put the card um, I know that's a little bit confusing that's just the way it is but there are a total of seven PCI Express uh, slots four of them are 16 times electrically three of them are eight times electrically it's only when you uh, put stuff in that you know it makes it any different um, oh crikey smashing the uh, the tripod but there are like I said, there are a few fan headers we've got two there two at the side there's that one at the top that I mentioned previously and then there's two more up here so two here two here going up there's the one up here that I mentioned before and then there's two more on this side so there's a fair few fan headers uh, considering if you were going to be using this as a as a workstation I'm just going to move the tripod back now the uh, test bench um, is a little devil uh, PC V4 that I will be reviewing a later date I like with these things I like to use them for a little bit first to kind of get a bit of a feel for them uh, but one of the reasons why I'm using this for this review is it does actually have the mounts to be able to put the the uh, extra pins in for the uh, EBB board which is what this is because it's a slightly bigger form factor than ATX ATX would end about here EATX would be about here so there's a fair old amount there's like an extra 50 millimeters of room there um, just for those I mean I'm not going to name all the cases that support this but just to chuck this out there the um, NZXT Switch 810 does support an EBB motherboard uh, it's a form factor that seems to have been picked up by quite a few um, vendors with motherboards that are upcoming um, I'm not too sure about how many um, more HCPX boards that we're going to be seeing but this is kind of a decent format it's 12 inches by 13 inches and like I said with the um, uh, the Switch 810 support on it you may well see this board in that rig in the not too distant future we've done the uh, we've used uh, an Asus 7970 just so that we can uh, make it comparable with some of the other tests that we've done previously uh, and for this review we're just going to be doing the CPU tests we're not going to be doing any gaming or anything like that on this um, so right it's now time for me to uh, break on again and then we can uh, start to have a look at the benchmarks right then peeps on to the benchmarks on the left we've got the 3960X at 4.6 gigahertz then on the right we've got the uh, 2687 uh, which it can turbo up to 3.4 gigahertz so as we can see that the 3960X does actually um, beat the uh, the Xeons even though with the Xeons we've basically there got 16 cores and 32 threads so essentially what this does is show us that 3D Mark really prefers a higher core speed than lots more cores and it's pretty much the same I'll miss the extreme score and we'll go on to Vantage now Vantage previously was always a big CPU benchmark as in you could always tell with um, uh, Vantage if you had a strong CPU but if you have a look at the 3960X you can see that we've got a CPU score of 47,151 yet with the Xeons we've only got a CPU score of 45,477 so that yet again shows us that Vantage is more of a core speed program rather than a more cores program so to kind of wrap up from those two that would show us that uh, say for argument say you would be better off with if you if you're looking for stuff with this with a big overclock rather than a lot lot more cores or more you could even go a little bit more in depth and say maybe Vantage really does not see all these cores um, but it's just one of those things that if we could overclock these they would go uh, if, like if we could match the Xeons on the board all at 4.6 gigahertz we probably see the scores go rocketing the fact that they're so close even though we've got a massive core speed difference does still show that they're strong but like I said it does 
you know, prove that the, the, the 3D Mark benchmarks do prefer that higher core speed a lot more. Right then, peeps. This is Cinebench. This is really where the, the scores start to show a lot different. One thing I will say is ignore the OpenGL results because they were done on different graphics cards. I can't find the screenshot for the 3960X doing Cine with a 7970. It's the CPU only results that we want to look at. Now, the CPU only there, that is a stock 3960X. And then we've got the, the stock Xeon. So we can see that there's a 15 point difference. Um, and that's massive. When we broke the 10, um, uh, with, uh, when we broke the 10 points mark with the 3960X as a stock CPU, we were gobsmacked. But what I'm going to do quickly is just stop the camera and find the overclock result for you quickly. Right, so onto the uh, 3960X with an overclock. We can see we basically got almost four extra points with the overclock. So that was that was pushing it up to uh, three point, uh, sorry, 4.6 gigahertz, and we got 13.92 points, which that again originally dumbfounded us it was just like man these scores are amazing but look at the xeon still do you know what i mean 25 points and that was with with the uh two six eight sevens even the two six sixty cpu just running at 2.2 .2 gigahertz scored a solid 20 points now this is really where these cpus start to come into their own it's the it's the the processing power, all those extra cores being able to munch things. Something that with the benchmarks that uh, we, we've seen is just that the, um, uh, as far as gaming is concerned, it's not where these are at. These are pure hardcore um, workstation stroke server CPUs. These are for just graphical kind of, it's not graphical, sorry, just compute, computational, what, I can't think of the word, Basically, just being able to do absolutely loads, taking all those threads and using them. So when it comes to rendering images um, and you know really kind of hardcore tasks, that is when these um, CPUs really start to come in their, into their own. But I don't really want to go into too much about this before we go into the conclusion. Um, also, with um, uh, you need to go and look at the main review because I don't really want to, you know, start showing you even more and more results. But I, I'll, I'll just find you one quickly to show you the difference between with AES, which is encryption. Right, this is um, in uh, the IDA benchmark sections. Now, basically, what I've done is I have zoomed these in a little bit more just so that you can see the numbers a bit easier. But on the left, we've got the uh, 3960X, which in this benchmark was running at 4.75 uh, gigahertz. Uh, it was a 125 base clock, but I can't remember the multiplier. But basically, this was the highest AES score we'd ever got. And it was uh, 927,748. And this was massive, absolutely massive. This was, if you have a look underneath here, there's a stock 990X, 3.466 gigahertz. And that was only 352,000. So it was an enormous increase. You go on to the Xeons, however, and uh, it was a little bit of a different story because this is 2,897,062. It's so close, it's almost 2 million points in front. And so if you're doing a lot of work, like I said, when it comes to stuff like with these, it really is like proper hardcore tasks. It's not a, the, the type of setup that you're going to be using for everyday stuff. Um, and this was one of the results that really, really shocked us. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and find the uh, folding at home results for you. And we'll put those side by side as well. Right, moving on to folding at home, one thing I do need to say is OC3D has got its own folding team, Team 98860. Uh, we're practically in the top 50 worldwide now. now that might not sound like a, uh, a massive number, we're only in the top 50, um, but we're only a small team. Um, I think we're doing massively, massively well, and there's an awesome community on the um, OC3D forums if you want to go and check it out. 
uh, which is why whenever I get a chance I always try and drip the folding into the review. Sometimes with graphics cards and stuff we can't do it just because it's not supported yet as with the 680. But anyway, moving on to this. Uh, 53,470 points per day with the uh, 3960X running um, at the 4.75 gigahertz overclock. Moving on to the, um, the Xeons, another thing we need to bear in mind is that the, uh, this, they only turbo up to about 3.4, but we're still getting 114,000 points per day. Um, it's just a completely insane uh, number and that's without bonus points and stuff like that because these will be uh, viable for bonus points with big advantage work units because we've got enough cores um, on these in fact one CPU has got enough cores because you need a minimum of 16 cores for to be able to do the big advantage work units now and where this is an 8 core with hyper threading technically uh, 16 cores as far as this is concerned um, with one CPU you can do the bonus units or the big advance unit, sorry. Uh, so this 114 could go up even further with the, uh, the bonus units. So it's, it, the scores are absolutely immense. Um, so yes, uh, so for argument's sake, you did get one of these, you could churn out some massive scores because alongside the, uh, the motherboard, you could also have uh, four graphics cards running in there as well. So it's completely, completely bonkers the amount that you could get out of this. But I wanted to keep this review solely about uh, CPU benchmarks and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to move on to a conclusion and have a good chat in the conclusion to, uh, you know, work out, uh, or sorry, to talk about all the, the variables and stuff with this. And then, uh, yeah, we'll get it all wrapped up there. So I'm going to shush my mouth and get the camera reset so that we can do the conclusion. Right then peeps, moving on to the conclusion and as ever we'll talk about the, uh, I'll tell you the award and then we'll discuss everything else afterwards and we've decided to give it the OC 3D Performance Award and the reason why it's Performance Award rather than the Gold Award is because where it's a dual Z on board um, you generally have to uh, spend a lot of money on two Xeons before you can even make it work and the Xeons are a lot of money the uh, 2687s that I've got in here at the moment are £1,400 each. You can't use a, three, a pair of 3960Xs in this at all. It doesn't work. Then the, the 3960s are not made to be run together. The Xeons have got the extra instructions built in them that you can run them side by side. Um, so right. Obviously you can get the cheaper ones, but as you move further down the line, that's how the core speeds and stuff drop. I think the 2660s are about £1,100, £1,200 each. But it really depends what you're going to be using them for, because as we, I've shown, um, this type of system really doesn't shine when it comes to what you would kind of call a gaming rig. Um, also, quite surprisingly, what we've also shown is where this doesn't shine as a gaming rig, my thoughts about taking this and filling it full of graphics cards and trying to push my results that I'd got previously with four 7970s doesn't really look like it's going to um, uh, be able to be done. Because where we can't overclock these at all, as you can see by the results that we've got, especially in Vantage, the CPU score is significantly lower. Uh, and it was the CPU score that we really needed to be much higher so that when we fill it full of graphics cards, it didn't bottleneck. So the fact that we can't really push this any further already by adding all the cards in really isn't going to be making a lot of difference, which I have to admit, I'm disappointed about from a personal level, but that's not a problem with the motherboard. That's just where Intel have locked the Xeons down. This should also give you guys something to think about with other dual Xeon boards that may be getting released at a later date that gone are the days of these being the most amazing, quickest, uh, fastest uh, gaming systems that you can build. Um, to the point as where if you was to say to me today, what would you advise me to get? I just want an amazing gaming rig. I would probably tell you to go and buy something like the Rampage 4 Extreme, which as far as I'm concerned at the moment, is still the best 2011 board on the planet. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a catch-22. All the things that people are putting in and there to like their dream spec list with these Xeon processors, 
really isn't the way that they're going to be and I'm quite interested to see how things pan out with other manufacturers because this isn't an, an Asus problem, it's an Intel problem where they've locked them down. Um, now the Asus board itself does everything you could possibly ask of it. There's oodles of SATA ports on it, you've got onboard uh, um, switches, this is definitely a, a, a locker uh, a workstation rig though you can tell that by the onboard uh, USBs for if it would have been in a rack because obviously when you go into the data center you generally just pull it out there's not really a lot of chance for you to get right around the back of them without taking the whole rack out um, it kept cool calm and collected the whole time when we left the folding at home on overnight the uh, MOSFET heat sinks at the top above the CPUs did get warm to touch but never at any point did the, the chipset feel like it was getting too hot. I mean, it's just, it's just warm. It's not hot at all. So that little extra heat sink does its job very well. The thing about this board and these types of processes is they really are built for things like um, 3D modeling, things like in Cinebench, big, proper, like multi-layered video rendering, so like After Effects and all that kind of stuff, stuff where you really are going to be maxing out all the possible cores that you can get, the type of programs that really love loads and loads and loads of threads. Um, and so it, it's those kind of programs, it, they will thrive. You, you saw with the Cinebench result that it was just ridiculous. The, the score was up there and so many professionals out there look at Cinebench as a, a kind of a, a gauge to see how well their programs are going to be doing um, uh, you know, with their specific CPU. I know a lot of people look at that and kind of use that as a specific benchmark. So the fact that we've now got rigs that are pumping out over 20 uh, points in Cinebench We'll be getting a hell of a lot of people out there uh, massively, massively excited. One of the things that we've kind of said in the review, it's just like, this is the type of rig that if you're thinking about becoming like your own homegrown version of Pixar, or you do, a lot, like I said, a lot of 3D modeling, like fluid works, that kind of stuff, this will absolutely decimate that program to the point where I wish I'd, you know, maybe downloaded some trial versions or something to kind of show you the difference between the 396X and this because that's where this starts to excel. Um, it's far and beyond the realms of just a gaming rig. It's so much just a massive, it's kind of like, I don't know how to explain it, just like a proper gutsy um, workstation rig. It's just like the gaming rig just, you know, does its, uh, I don't know how to explain it really. I'm trying to kind of get things in my head, but if you imagine like this being the type of thing, being like a really big burly workman that just gets in there, does its job, ah, yeah, come on, loads of power, loads of grunt, can do loads of things at once. Whereas like a gaming rig, it's kind of a very specific thing, doesn't really need a lot of CPU power, doesn't need a lot of threads. I, I, in the back of my head, I've got kind of like uh, Japanese rice burners and like, full-on American muscle kind of cars whereas and then again you can kind of tune those two to, to kind of outcompete each other so it's, it's a bit of a difficult one I've not really come up with an amazing analogy for this one so I'm a bit I could have done if I'd really thought about it so I've let you down a bit um, but as far as the computer world goes if you're looking at buying this and doing the odd bit of gaming but you want an amazing workstation that's just going to blow the doors off of all your really CPU intensive tasks then this will be right up, your shit, use that right up your street. But if you're looking to fill this for the graphics cards and use it as a massive gaming machine, in the old days with the older Jules Eon boards, that would have been all right because you could still overclock them. But where Intel have locked it down now, I would honestly say that as far as uh, like the 3D benchmark, 3D um, mark benchmarks are concerned and games and the like of that, they are probably gonna respond better to a higher core speed rather than more cores themselves. So in that respect, I would tell you to take a step back, go and get yourself a Rampage 4, get yourself some decent fast memory, 3960X, and then overclock it to within an inch of its life, and you will get a much better system for gaming with that than with any of the Jules Eon systems. Um, so, I'm going to try and leave this here. Now the, the Asus board is available for about 370 quid. As far as a, a, a massive workstation board like this is concerned, 
it's actually not a bad price and I really really like it and I'm going to be doing a few more things with this not necessarily built along the, the realms of like an immense gaming rig but for something that's like like I said a workstation that's just going to be immensely fast immensely snappy chew through loads of um, CPU intensive tasks uh, because as many of you will know as far as my main rig in the office is concerned I don't game on it so this is absolutely smack bang up my street um, so yeah it's it's a it's a bit of a it's a double-edged sword and I've hopefully I've explained to you where this will thrive and will be worth the investment and also when this is just uh, something that somebody may get confused and end up spending a lot of money when they could really have saved a lot of money on processors more than anything um, and then put the money to better use in other areas. So it's not a gamer, it's a full on kind of heart pounding, big gutsy workstation. Uh, so yeah, that's it guys. This is what all the fuss has been about. A lot of people have been saying, why have you not done this board yet? Uh, I don't need to name it, it's not out yet. But it's gonna be the same story because you can't overclock. Although I will be getting one. But for now at least, with the first uh, 2011 Jewel Z on board that we've touched at Overclock 3D. Don't forget to click the link underneath to take you to the full review with all the graphs where we've uh, compared the 3960X with the 2660s and the 2687 CPUs. So you've got three CPUs in there to take a look at. And it really does explain in the graphs the programs that, uh, r that thrive with the CPU power and the ones that are all graphics based. Like Unigen, for example, there literally was a couple of frames either side. You had uh, the 2660s came in, two points in front of that was the 3960X at 4.8 gigahertz, 4.6 gigahertz. Two points in front of that was the um, uh, 2687s. So basically that's within a margin of error. That just shows that Unigen pretty much, as far as when you get up this high up the, the range, is all graphical based power. And I could guarantee you that if I run different graphics cards on all three of the CPUs again, they'd all be within that tiny, tiny, tiny difference. Because Unigen really is all about graphics. So, with the, uh, the Asus crazy Dual Z on board, that we, we gave Performance Award rather than Gold because you need to factor in the fact that you do need to spend an immense amount of money on processors. It's all right buying the board, but you've then got to get a specific set of processors in them and none of them are cheap. And it all needs to be E5 processors, basically. Um, so that's why we give it Performance, not Gold, because as you saw, especially with the CPU intensive stuff, it's immense. So, this is Tiny Tom Logan with maybe what may seem as a surprising ending for you with another video out.